Testing, one, two, three, testing. Welcome, survivors. This is the Eerie Night of the Pseudo Posse, and last week, we did a video on screamers, specifically how to prevent them from noticing you after they've spawned. In my naivete, I decided to focus only on prevention. I thought all the numbers, XMLs, all of that stuff involved with heat mechanics would bore you guys to death. I was wrong. Well, at least for some of you. Many people expressed in the comments the desire to learn more about the heat generation mechanics. More numbers. And not only that, you guys also brought up some very good points about some things I didn't test in the last video for prevention, such as does crouching reduce the screamer hearing range? How does feral sense affect range? Can screamers see through doors? And do screamers hear from the source of noise location or the player location? All good questions. Ooh, you guys got me. Got me so good. I was rather embarrassed missing all of that stuff. I am now here to rectify that mistake. But as the saying goes, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> Remember, you guys asked for this. We're going to break down the video as follows. We'll first discuss the mechanics of heat generation, how production stations like the Forge generate heat, and other sources of heat ranging from player actions to the environment. For that last one, I created a spreadsheet which can be found in a Google Drive link in the video description if you want an itemized list of all, and I repeat, all sources of heat in the game. And some of the things on that list are pretty surprising. Last but not least, we'll wrap up the video with things we missed from the test's last video. So let's jump into the frying pan and crank up the heat. In our discussion of heat generation and how that works to spawn in screamers, we need to start with chunks. The game world is split into grid sections called chunks, 16 by 16 regions that extend from bedrock to sky. This is how the game loads in the game world as you move around, by the chunks within your vicinity. And it caches, or in other words, stores the ones far away that you've already visited in memory. So if you leave home to go loot, your home is still there when you come back. Chunks are assigned two numbers which designate the row and column of the chunk location in the global grid. By pressing F8 twice while in debug mode, you can see the heat generation, which we'll get to momentarily, but you can also see the chunks designation. Currently, I am located in chunk 271 by minus 173. As you can see, when I move forward, minus 173 shifts to minus 172. This is because I moved one row over within the grid. To visualize this better for you all, I have constructed this grid that outlines each chunk, which I was able to do by painting the point at which the numbers change. Each box is 16 by 16, except on the edges, since my floor doesn't extend far enough at the borders. Those chunks are still 16 by 16 in size, just cut off by my visual representation. Anyway, as we move forward through a single column over all of its rows, the first number decrements. And if we move through a single row over all its columns, the second number increments. Easy enough? All right, since we all are now experts on chunks, I'm going to have Taco throw up this graphic to illustrate heat generation along with some in-game footage. We'll start with a clean chunk with no activity and zero heat. Heat can be generated either by active or passive means. We will dive into each type of heat generation a bit later, but at a high level, active heat accumulates per instance of an event, like each time you shoot a gun. Passive heat accumulates over a set frequency, like a dew collector gathering water and generating heat once per hour. Whether by active, passive, or a combination of the two, once heat grows to a strength of 25, three things can happen. In the first scenario, the heat stops accumulating, no scream responds, and we enter a short cooldown period in which no heat is gained or lost. It is just frozen. Once the cooldown period ends, we are left with zero heat and are able to accumulate once again if heat generating events are still ongoing. The second scenario is instead of no screamer being spawned, we get a screamer spawn. How many screamers do we get? Well, according to the XML code, you have a chance to spawn one or two of them at a time. And similar to hordes, there are waves with a chance to spawn an additional one to two screamers per wave. Just like our previous scenario with no screamer spawn, heat stops generating and we enter a cooldown, though this time it is a much longer one. This is probably meant to give the player a break between potential screamer spawning events. Once the cooldown ends, we are back to zero heat and ready to repeat. This third scenario is no event triggers, no cooldown, no screamers, nothing, except the heat continues to accumulate. Once it reaches 100, there is 
there's a guaranteed screamer spawn, which works the same way as scenario two. Now in all my testing, I always had an early stopping event at 25 heat strength. So I never witnessed the heat going to 100. However, I still included that in my discussion as the XML comment within the code still mentions that a screamer is spawned once 100 is reached. So I think in theory that should still happen. But regardless of that, the early 25 heat threshold is exactly why veteran players feel screamers come more quickly now. In previous alphas, there was no 25 heat threshold and all that happened was heat would increase till it reached 100 with a guaranteed screamer. Okay, that is the basic premise, but let's dive into the specific mechanics of heat generation as it relates to passive and active sources. Heat map strength is the value of heat added to the running total within a chunk. Both passive and active sources of heat have this parameter and contribute. Passive heat accumulates over time and is purely limited to these blocks. Torches, candles, burning barrels, campfire, dew collector, forge, cement mixer, chemistry station, and the workbench. As long as a block is on, meaning it is performing its function, heat is created. Turning on one campfire adds five to the heat strength within our chunk. Turning on an additional campfire will stack another five on top. But notice the total isn't 10. If heat was only additive, screamers would be coming crazy rapidly. However, over time, heat strength decays. The heat map time defines the total amount of time for the heat generation to stick around, adding its amount to the total heat strength. Below the total strength, you'll see two line items for both events, turning on the first and second campfire. So you'll see the name of the source, campfire, and to the right of the parentheses, you'll see a decimal number which is the remaining heat generated by the campfire. To the right, you'll see a second number, which keeps ticking down. That is the heat map time. And as it ticks down, so does the heat provided by the campfire. Now, if the time reaches zero and the event isn't active, in this case, that would mean the fires are off or the campfire is completely gone, it would remove the event and its heat from the total amount. However, since our campfire is still on here, it doesn't get a chance to reach that. As once we reach one in-game hour after initially turning on the first campfire, the percentage increases by another five. And moments later, after one hour from turning on the second campfire, an additional five is added. What gives? Well, that has to do with the heat map frequency, which is only applied to passive heat generation sources. This is the in-game interval for heat to restat. 1000 is equivalent to one in-game hour, so the campfire will add its heat map strength of 5 again to the accumulated heat once every hour. But because of the decay, you aren't getting the full 5 every hour. All of the other blocks I mentioned work in this manner. Dew collectors, unlike campfires, don't have an on switch. They always collect water passively, thus they always generate heat passively. Torches and candles are the same exact way. They'll passively generate a small amount of heat as long as they are deployed. Workbenches generate heat as long as they are crafting something. The chemistry station as long as it is burning fuel. And same thing with forges. Burn fuel, generate the heat. Up till now, we've stayed in the same chunk in which we have placed our production stations. What happens if we venture off to surrounding chunks? Well, it turns out in the chunks nearby, they have the same exact heat generated as the chunk that holds the heat sources. The further you go, the heat is the same, so it doesn't have a decaying scale with distance. Except there are some neighboring chunks in which there is no heat generated. After all the testing I've done, I don't have a clear explanation as to why. Could be a bug of some sort. If we look at the grid from high above as I run around, I'll jump in the chunk in which heat is present so Taco can indicate that on the map in editing. After I've checked out all the chunks, you can easily see how the heat is spread through the neighboring chunks. And again, the heat in all chunks is the same. So that means as the heat ticks up in each chunk, that is a chance the screamer can spawn within multiple regions. Okay, intermission time pause the video and digest. For those thinking right now, I am overwhelmed by all the numbers. Remember, it was the will of the people in the comments section from the last video. And for those who directly asked for it, you don't deserve an intermission. You continue watching, reap what you have sowed. That pretty much covers passive heat generation, which is very much limited to your base as that is where you'll have all your production stations most likely. However, many of you have likely encountered screamers while out looting or after a late game horde in which it takes a bit of time to mop up the remaining zombies only for a screamer or two to come knocking. 
All of this is related to active heat generation, which includes all heat generated directly or indirectly by player action. There are nearly 300 different actions that can generate heat, so go download the spreadsheet from the Google Drive link in the description if you want to see all the sources and their associated values. But for our demonstration purposes, I've decided to condense that into 11 broad categories, and we'll go through each one by one. Unlike passive heat generation, there is no heat map frequency. Heat doesn't generate every hour. Instead, it is added upon each instance of the event. Let's start with the first category, augers and chainsaws. For these tools, heat is added to the total each time you left click and rev up the engine. If you run it continuously, meaning holding on the left click, heat isn't repeatedly added. Only when you stop and start again is it added. So it is definitely better to run till you need to reload rather than starting and stopping. And like with the passive heat, the heat is not confined to the chunk in which the event occurred. Heat is spread out all over. And we'll demonstrate that in the same way by running around and jumping where the heat is present so Taco can show it off here. This is why you will rarely see a screamer spawn right on top of you as she can spawn in any of these neighboring chunks. Our second category is guns. With guns, each shot, each bullet will generate heat. Each shot of our pistol generates 0.65. And of course, the heat extends outward to other chunks. Now, now if we crouch while shooting, we only gain 0.52 heat. This is because active heat sources have a muffled crouching scaling factor which will reduce the heat strength by that scale. However, this does not reduce the spread of the heat across the chunks. In fact, it affects the same exact chunks as if we stood while shooting. All crouching does is reduce the heat generated per shot. Silencers also reduce the amount of heat generated. This time, we gained only 0.4. Like crouching, the range of heat spread is unchanged. Guns have different heat strengths. Obviously, till now we've only shot the pistol, but if you use different guns, you'll generate a different amount of heat with shotguns generating the highest of all guns at a whopping 1.0 heat per shot. Yikes. Active heat sources also have a heat map time. So once it reaches zero, the heat contributed by that event is removed from the total. Okay, this next category is rather special. Whenever an animal senses is alerted by your presence or dies, that generates heat, supposedly. The XML file contains all the heat generation parameters for these events, but when actually trying it out in game, I don't see the heat added. Whether it's alerting a bear or a stag or even a damn rabbit, nothing. And killing them either also, no heat. So not sure what is going on here. Could be a bug as it is most certainly there in the XML code, but doesn't seem to work in game. Though calling that out may make you hate me more as there will be yet another way to generate heat faster. But hey, remember, you guys asked for this information. So don't shoot the messenger. The next category is rather surprising, but player death also causes heat generation. We need to test that out. Any volunteers? Okay, posse. I know you're always the one watching me. So thanks for your involuntary volunteer. As the dire wolf claims it's a victim, look at that heat generated. Thanks, posse. But wait, we're not done. The fun pimps thought it was fitting to categorize the type of death, though so drowning supposedly generates a different amount of heat. Hey there, posse. Can you do me a solid? Thank you, buddy. And look at that. Heat generated. And significantly less than dying on dry land. Superb. New meta, everyone. If you are playing as part of a team, do your buddies a favor if you are about to die. Jump in the nearest body of water and let nature take course. They'll thank you for it as your death will be less likely to draw screamers. All right, that last one is probably my favorite, but this next category, the fifth by my count, is definitely less niche, and that is hitting and destroying blocks. That's right. When you hit certain types of materials, it will generate heat. But not all materials are that way. Hitting this wood block does nothing. However, destroying it will bump up the temperature. This is also another reason why augers generate a tremendous amount of heat. Not only do they generate heat at startup as we already discussed, but they will also generate heat by hitting or destroying blocks. Pickaxes will of course generate heat upon bashing blocks, but unlike augers, they don't generate heat simply by swinging. The sixth category is the environment. The main thing I want to include in this category is the police car alarm. Upon activating the alarm, heat is generated, though by itself it isn't enough to draw screamer attention unless combined with other sources of active heat like all the shooting. Our next category is very broad. 
as it encompasses opening and closing objects. In the case of loot containers, we can bring up the police car again, as 0.05 heat is generated upon opening it and an additional 0.05 upon closing it. That's right, you get hit by it twice. That goes for everything in this category. Take all the POI dungeon tiered chests, opening and closing each one produces heat. All ammo and food piles generate heat as well, probably because the object is destroyed upon looting it. Not all loot containers will generate heat, like the mailboxes for example. Again, you can reference the spreadsheet in the Google Drive link if you want to know all the pesky loot containers that will contribute to heat strength. I've also included the opening and closing of doors in this category. Every time you open or close a door, it will generate a bit of heat. Excluding wood doors. Not much, but when you start to add up all these little sources of heat that we've already covered, it can add up pretty quickly. On to category number eight. Some electric devices also can generate some heat. For one, simply opening and closing the generator adds some heat strength, though this could be technically included in the previous category. But the real culprits here are the traps that are noisy, like the blade trap, ouch, the turrets, of course, and supposedly the dart trap according to the XMLs. But again, didn't see any heat added from that in game. So maybe another bug. Though fence posts make noise when activated, they actually don't generate heat, so that's nice. Category nine are explosions. Yeah, this one is rather obvious, but surprise, loud noises create a lot of heat. Who would have thought? Pipe bombs, grenades, and molotovs are all included in this category. That being said, it won't stop anyone from using them because they're just so much fun. Okay, number 10, we're almost there. This one is rather obvious, vehicles. Except this one also seems buggy. Same story, it is in the XML code, but doesn't actually add heat in the game while driving around. So feel free to drive without penalty for now. All right, last category of active heat sources. Number 11, and the honor of last and kind of surprising inclusion is traders. Those traders. So apparently during the morning and evening announcements for opening, close warning and closing, it generates heat. And again, this is yet another seemingly buggy one. Do I have to repeat again? No, okay for completeness. XML code, doesn't work in game. Okay, happy now? Well, that's how he works in a nutshell, if that were the largest nut ever. But yeah, that's it. If anyone feels tired after that onslaught, feel free to point the fingers at those who requested this. Thanks guys. Also, we're not done. Yes, yes, we're, we're done with the heat mechanics, but if you recall from the beginning, I said we would wrap up with some unfinished tests from the last video. In the previous one, we tested how to prevent screamers from seeing you after they spawned. So I tested out what block shape to block line of sight and the distance required to avoid their aggro by making noise typical of what you might expect while at home. I don't want to reiterate all of that here, so go check out that video after this one if you haven't seen it yet. But the takeaway from the distance test is that 15 blocks from the wall is the minimum distance required to prevent the screamer from hearing you. One mistake though that I did make in that video was that I measured the distance from the wall instead of the source of noise like I did say in the video. So it actually should be 16 blocks from the noise source. Someone pointed that out, so thank you. But anyway, our first question we want to answer. Is the distance the screamer hears originating from the player position or the noise source? Well, to answer that, I'll be standing by the wall where we stood last time, but I'll open the chest from further away. So if it's based on player position, placing her one block closer than the minimum distance will cause her to come running. If however, it is based on the storage chest location, you'll be more than 16 blocks away and ignore us. After running that test, it would appear it is based based on the player's position. Surprise! Thanks again the comment from the last video. Our next question from the last video was does crouching have any effect? And the answer to that is it sure does. At around the block marked eight, she doesn't hear. But at seven, she does and comes running. Previously, that was the block marked 15. So when doing things around home, stay crouched as much as possible as it roughly halves the hearing distance. Okay, two more questions. The next one was, can screamers see through doors? The answer to that is yes, but only if the door is open. If the door is closed, she can't see. And the last question, how does feral sense affect the hearing range? Well, it turns out the length of my test setup is inadequate, which, oh boy, we need to extend that out a bit. I hope 45 is okay. And after multiple rounds of testing, it would appear around 42 blocks from the wall or about 44 blocks from our position is the range. So if playing with feral sense on, crouch all the time, build high or very low below ground to stay far away. All right, finally done. 
Hope that wasn't too much of a chore, folks. A part of me wishes I included all the heat mechanics in the last video, but that would have made the single video closer to 30 minutes long, so maybe it is a bit more manageable to split it between two videos. Heat mechanics and avoidance methods. I don't know, maybe I'm just making self-soothing excuses. Probably, likely. Anyways, if you still are here and haven't hit the like button, obviously you stuck around this long, so you don't hate the video. So I mean, you know. Also, subscribe and join the ranks of our community as we have a lot of fun. I mean, you only need to look at all the numbers displayed in this video as proof of that. Don't forget to hit the bell for notifications so you don't miss the next number crunching video. Lastly, I want to send a mighty shout out to all of our Patreons. Thank you all so much for your support and generosity. On that note, this is Erie Knife signing off. See you all in the next one. By the way, I was working on a base build before you all asked me to do this here, so I'm going to return to that now. Adios.